Hey everybody, welcome back to Codography Team. Today we're talking about Python, and we're also talking about C++. We're talking about two programming languages and which one is superior. We're also going to be digging into can Python really handle a complex 3D game, and can Python handle anything that's complex at all? I actually did a video like this a couple of years back, and the amount of support and love I got was overwhelming. It got me thinking, hey, people loved that one so much. Maybe it's time for a second look at it. So we're going to start by taking a look at a game written in Python that I wrote and a game written in C++. So a bit of backstory. My very first programming language was Python. Well, technically it was Batch, if you consider that a programming language. After Batch, I had heard about the Python's where it's at. You can do anything with it. Those classic Udemy ads. I mean, those things are everywhere. But there's nowhere a Udemy ad can't go. And then I decided, hey, maybe I should learn Python. It's got to be easier than Batch. And it was. And I got a lot of stuff done. And then after that, I found myself gravitating towards something called C++. And that's kind of the origin story of programming for me. So let's just see how many all these hundreds of sprites Python can do. So let's run it. Ooh, look at that splash screen. Very nice. All right, so there used to be sound on this. I can't play it right now because I'm recording using that sound channel. So for now, we're gonna have to do without. But look at these, look at the graphics. Now also, it's not supposed to be in windowed mode. It's supposed to be full screen mode, but I'm playing it in windowed mode so that we can actually take a look at our frame rate. So let's hit play. All right, so along the left in this window, you're gonna see the frame rate, as said right here, and you're also gonna see the amount of entities that are in the world. And we're clipping along at 139 frames per second, which for 2D platforming seems a little slow. So if I wiggle around, let's just see what we got going. I think it was K, K, yeah, K to attack. Oh, look, die! You should pay for your crimes. Okay, did I make it? Oh, look at that. Look at that. They disappeared into the vortex. All right, so we're going to jump along. So you'll notice seeing that we're clipping along at about 120 frames per second average. Now, the way the game is run... Oh, okay, we're not. now it's going to poo-poo. So we just went from our 120 frames per second to only 30 frames per second. And that's because I, as bad a coder as I was back then, I was smart enough to know that we shouldn't be updating all these players when we're down below and they can't access the player in any way. So that is sluggish as ever. Let's close out. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, Marty, you're just a bad coder. Can't really argue with you there. When I made that game, I don't even know if I was a coder yet. That code is nasty. Let's just <laughs> crack this thing open. So what do we have here? <laughs> we got main.py, which opens menu.py, which menu.py opens level1.py. Now, level1.py, the interesting thing is I loaded countless cutouts for the sprite sheets, right? So you're thinking, okay, but they're just loaded once, right? Right? <laughs> no. No, I loaded these things three times in three separate files. I created a separate main function for every different level. Now we ask ourselves, why? I don't know. I wasn't really good at programming and I was just trying to get anything at all to work. So I was throwing crap together like you wouldn't believe just squishing it into this ball, but the point still stands, because that wasn't a lot of entities to take into account for. And to be honest, is there really much I could have done to optimize the code? I certainly could have cleaned things up a little bit, but really, I wouldn't have gotten myself much better of a frame rate, even if I'd done every possible thing to optimize, because you can't really optimize in Python. It doesn't allow you to, because it doesn't give you access to memory management, and a lot less control is handed over to the user. It's not meant for speed. With that said, Let's check out what the opposition has to say and open up our C++ game. So by the time I hit C++, I had a couple programming languages under my belt. My old dome piece had developed a bit more. I had considerable more experience with programming. So by this point, I had a few notions that creating a separate main function and loading all the sp possible sprite sheets for every file just wasn't a good idea. So here's the game. It's actually a prototype for a game I do plan to release. Oh, look at that speed. If we look along the left, you will see right here our frame rate. It's currently telling us we're rendering at 5,000 frames per second, which for 2D platformer sounds about right. We also got this number of rats. We'll get back to that in a second, the number of crates on screen. So far, it seems like as if C++ is the obvious winner, but let's put this thing under a bit of a load. So if I right click, places 10 rats. If I right click a bunch more, my goodness, that's a lot of rats. You know, these rodents look like they're kind of hungry. They're hungry for human flesh. I better start running from these things. 300 rats, and our frame rate has been halved. 
Now I'm actually running this in debug instead of release mode, which release mode optimizes more and just gives you better speed. The reason for doing that is because I didn't convert that Python code into an executable, which would have upped Python speed. So I'm kind of balancing it out, kind of squinting with one eye open, kind of making it work. So anyway, still 2000 frames per second. That's pretty good. Let's see if we can do more and let's place a secondary rat. So that rat is a little bit bigger and he looks a little hungrier. So perhaps we should run a bit faster, maybe even build ourselves, build ourselves a couple platforms to jump onto. They will not get us, or will they? Oh, yeah, they're gonna get us. All right, so I've placed some more, more rats. All right, we're now down to 700 frames per second and dropping by the second. We're still doing not bad though. Okay, we're, get, we're getting lower, but now we're feeling the pain. Yes, I don't know how well the recording pick software picks this up too. This actually does run a lot better when I'm not recording too. So, you know, as they say, the proof is in the pudding. For the next segment, I've prepared this delightful little table that's gonna give us a bit more information on C++ and Python. So C++ is awesome and wholesome. Python is unashamedly slow. Python makes no bones about it. It's a slow programming language. Python is slower than a crippled turtle, whereas C++, is faster than a rabbit on nitroglycerin. Look, look at that turtle. That turtle's, you know, he's laid up. He's he's not gonna be going anywhere anytime soon. That that rabbit, on the other hand, that rabbit is doing things. He's going places. So uses C plus plus is used for AAA games. Um, Python, Python is not used for any games really. But C plus plus C plus plus is also the backbone behind Unreal, Unity, and other game engines. It's the software that actually powers the lighting, the graphics, and things like that. Now you may know that you can use Python and other scripting languages with game engines, and you can actually make a game with Python in a certain game engine. But what you're actually doing there is you're using Python as a scripting language. Python isn't handling any of the hard work or the load that's actually handled by C++. So all the number crunching and the advanced computations are handled by C++ or C. So why would you use Python for something like that? The reason is Python is a lot easier to actually write. Whereas C++ code, you do need to have in-depth knowledge of how C++ works to write efficient or not even efficient, just code that works. So C++ is also the backbone for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now you may have heard that Python is great at machine learning and artificial intelligence. But the thing about Python with AI and machine learning is it's so terrible at it. It actually needs C or C++ to actually function. So Python is generally the go-to for artificial intelligence or machine learning. The reason being is because there's a ton of different libraries out there that are actually written in C or C++. So things like TensorFlow and all the heavy backlifting, the number crunching is actually handled by C or C++ because Python is just too slow to do the computationally advanced problems. Anytime the work gets hard, Python just bails out. No questions asked. We'll drink all the pop, eat all the chips, but won't lift a finger to help you. That's Python for you. Now, the question is, is there a use for that in the artificial intelligence world? As much as I don't like Python, I'll have to squeeze a yes out. The advantage of writing your algorithms and your machine learning, handling your data with Python is that it's a lot easier and you're gonna get coding a lot faster. C++, instead of focusing on the concepts behind machine learning or artificial intelligence, you're gonna be focusing probably half on writing good C++ code and half on writing artificial intelligence code. So going with Python for machine learning is actually a smart move because you can import modules that will take care of a large part of the number crunching. Really, if you went to pure C++ for artificial intelligence, intelligence or machine learning, there wouldn't be that much of a difference between using a hybrid of C++ and Python. C++ has been around for decades. It's a tried and true operating system since 19, 1985. That's a long time. Um, Python is the jack of all trades and a master at being terrible and just sucking in general. Just, just sucks. Python's where it at. You can do anything with it. And that's really the problem with Python. The only real uses for Python are for people who aren't actually programmers. I mean by that people who aren't invested in actually knowing code, but rather are more interested in concepts like machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, and things like that. So it's for people who don't really care about the code, to them coding is just a tool involved in a bigger process going on. So it's kind of just like a semi-objective -object to a bigger long-term goal. The other uses for Python is it's great for a beginner's language, and that's because it's easy to learn and it introduces you to programming concepts just a little bit at a time. Uh, C++, C++ is a very useful language. 
used in developing operating systems like Windows, Mac, and Linux. Now that's because C++ is very fast and very efficient. Pretty much every program there is in some way incorporates C or C++. The downfall of Python of C++, however, and I think the only downfall of C++, well, there's two downfalls, is it's hard to learn and nobody can ever truly tap into the full potential of C++. I don't even think Bajarne Strutnip himself could fully optimize C++ to its capability. C++ takes a while to learn. There's a lot of nicks and knacks you gotta figure out with it. Whereas Python, you kind of have a more limited tool set and that limited tool set requires less knowledge of how the tools works whereas with C++ you need to know how every single tool works otherwise you're going to be blindly just hammering things together and just mushing and gushing your code and it's not going to look good it's not going to work good either and you'll probably confuse yourself so learning C++ it takes approximately a year if you really push yourself at it Python I'd say approximately in the context of a beginner I'd say a beginner could learn Python in about six months so Python definitely more beginner friendly than C++ the second downside to C++ is compilation. Compilation can take a while. That's because C++ is a compiled language. This means that something called a compiler does a whole bunch of hard work and turns the human code, which is C++, into machine code, which is ones and zeros. Now, depending on how large your program is, that can take some time because C++ is very much about efficiency. It's going to try and optimize your human code into the very best machine code it possibly can. And those optimizations can take some time. You might want to set the coffee on when you start compiling C++. C++ is very important to the program ecosystem. C and C++ are very intertwined into programming that I really couldn't see there being a programming world without those two programming languages. Actually, Python is written in C. Python, the most popular programming language there is, but I think that's really subject to change at any second. Python it can be very easily replaced. You see, C++ has a unique thumbprint that it's very efficient and fast. There's certainly a need for that in the programming world. And it's also, it's hard to write good, fast, efficient code. It's very difficult to do that. You know, writing just clunky old Python code, like writing a language like Python, it's certainly a lot easier to do than to actually write something like C++. So Python, I could easily see that being replaced in the next five years by something like, I don't know, even Java could replace Python easily enough. There's Cobra, there's Ruby, there's a ton of different programming languages. So Python is really expendable. Perhaps the biggest irritation I have with Python, and maybe it's the reason why I just don't like it so much, is it uses white space as syntax, which now that's a chump thing to do. That's just a chump thing to do. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna open up our Python, the little Python example we had earlier. <clears throat> so here's the Python code, right? Now observe. So if we do this right here, we're going to, I'm going to zoom in a second so we can see this better. We want to see this really good. So if we take this line 30 and we backspace like so, backspace like so, and then hit tab. Now to us, this looks exactly the same. And realistically speaking, this should be exactly the same thing. There should be zero difference, right? Zero difference. This should be fine. This code should work. But this is, this is why Python is just such a charm. It's such a wonderful language. And then we try and run it. We try and run it. What a wonderful thing we have here. What's this? Uh-oh. Tab error. Inconsistent use of tabs and spaces in indentation. And I'm telling you, these things are not fun to track down, all right? In the, in the brief few seconds I was doing Python code here, I'm telling you, it's not fun, you know? Because then you got to go delete, and then one, two, three, four, if you're using the wrong IDE for this, which I am. Secondarily, the debugging with the standard Python kit isn't very good. It's just not that good. Let's take out this colon, which you do need. So let's take it out and let's see what our delightful error message is. If we try and run this, oh, what do we have? Invalid syntax. Well, what do you mean invalid syntax? Just invalid syntax? Like, what does that mean? But really, Python knows what's wrong. It knows we're missing the semicolon and it could just say, hey, maybe you're missing a, a colon. But does it tell us? No, of course not, because it's Python. <laughs> Let's compare that with C++. Now, in C++, this code all works. We already know that. Now, what if we do, what if we do that? What if we do that? What if we do this? What if we go a little, a little crazy, put a giant space there? Will that work? I don't actually know. <laughs> it works. Works 100%. In C++, everything is controlled with semicolons. Therefore, it's a real programming language and through scopes in the form of curly braces. And these curly braces make everything a lot more clear. Also, C++ does not care one bit about the spacing at all. So you can do this. I don't know why you would. If you do that, that's not normal. Don't do that. In addition to that, 
in addition to that, might I also add that in, in Python, you have no idea what your data types are. You have no idea what is what. Now, what is this one? We don't know. It could be an integer. It could be a float. And I find that brings more confusion into an already modeled stew. This righto equals true. Well, how do we know that that's a Boolean? How do we know that this isn't just an int that we've set equal to one? How do we know that there's a difference? How do you know we can't treat this Boolean here as an integer? The answer is you just got to try it and see if the wonderful, helpful debugger that we took a look at earlier is going to tell you. In C++, you have to name every data type, and this avoids a lot of confusion. To wrap things up, both C++ and Python do have real-world applications and are very useful programming languages, a bit less so with Python. But that's just me. You're more than welcome to have your own opinion on it. If you do, just let me know in the comments section below. Thank you for watching and subscribing. Code like, and I will be seeing you next video right after a quick word from today's sponsor you know everybody loves everybody loves a goof and a gaff a joke and a laugh but the problem is not everything that is supposed to be funny actually makes people laugh and that's why we have treasure troves like mcvan buck mcvan buck trove from mosquito is a prelude to a bigger mcvan buck book that's a tongue twister that will be coming out later this year it's filled with three hilarious humor stories and that are written by my dad peter and mast it's complete with illustrations if i could find one there we go complete with the illustrations and is guaranteed to have you doubled over laughing so let's open this and have a read i was hoping max would be a fool at this point and ask me which way i would like to go i would have said we don't have time to chatter so why don't you take the left and i'll go to the right I knew that once he had crested the hill, the brush opened up and you could see for a mile or more. There was a good chance you might spot a bull, a big bull moose. But to my chagrin, I will go to the right, flowed from Max's lips faster than gossip at a tea party. Plan B was put into action. So now you're probably wondering, how do I get this wonderful Mick Van Buck mini book? Well, all you gotta do is just send your mailing address and full name to codegopher at gmail.com. And as part of a giveaway, I will be giving away 10 Mick Van Buck trophy mosquitoes to the first 10 people to ask. One has been given away already, so they're going fast, they're flying off the shelves. Laughter is guaranteed.